Welcome to the Black Men Rock Roundtable Discussion, where our intention is to engage black men in a powerful, positive dialogue about issues and events that empower black men to live extraordinary lives. I'm your host, Coach Michael Taylor. In this episode, we're, dis we're discussing ways to deal with the different challenges emotionally and psychologically that men deal with on a daily basis. So this topic is called men's emotional healing. And the reason this topic is so important is because I believe we live in a culture that conditions men not to feel. And as a result, men struggle with identifying and expressing their emotions authentically. This causes a multiplicity of challenges for men, including failed relationships, senseless acts of violence, depression, and a host of addictive and destructive behaviors. Our goal is to bring awareness to this issue, and my hope is that this conversation sheds light on why it's so important for men to be able to express their emotions openly and honestly. And so at this time, I'd like to introduce my panelists and give them an opportunity to introduce themselves. So, Judge, would you begin? Yes, Michael. My name is Judge Maddox. Um, I am a, a new warrior. I'm also a co-leader uh, of the New Warrior Training Adventure, which is a men's transformational initiatory weekend. Uh, I also facilitate containers called shadow work, which gives people opportunity to look deeply at what works and what doesn't work for them. And I'm also a coach of that of that model. Um, I'm a partner, a father, a grandfather, uh, and what I like to think most of all, a teacher. Thank you. And Ernest. Yes, Michael. Uh, my name is Ernest Patterson. I'm the program manager of an adolescent program at Memorial Herman Prevention and Recovery Center. I'm also a certified co-leader from the Mankind Project. I have a husband, uh, and daughters, and you know, father, and friend, and, and and I believe in this work and really inspiring men to 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 become better men. And I'm honored to just be in in your men's presence tonight. Thank you, Ernest and Mr. Richard. Hello, my name is Russell Richard. I'm a psychotherapist in clinical practice. I specialize in major life transitions uh, and men's issues. Uh, much of what I deal with with people, uh, the underlying aspects of most of the issues that people bring into my office have to do with emotions. So uh, this is definitely a topic that I am immersed with constantly. Uh, as is the other two panelists, I'm involved in the uh, Mankind Project as well, and I have led several weekends, and I'm also a practitioner of shadow work. Thank you. Now, it is my belief that the three most difficult words for a man to say is, I need help, followed by... I don't know. Because as mentioned, as men, I believe we are conditioned in our society to disconnect from our emotions. And it is my belief that it drives a lot of our negative behaviors. And so for those of you who are listening or viewing this video right now, I want to begin, first of all, by just when we talk about feelings and emotions, especially from a male perspective, uh, it can actually be a little confusing because we may not be real clear on what feelings and emotions are. So I'd like to take this opportunity to give my panelists an opportunity to give their definition of emotions. And I want to start with Russell. Russell, how would you define emotions? Well, you brought up a good point, Michael, between the feelings and emotions. We often use the terms interchangeably, but I become accustomed to asking what's your emotion instead of what's your feeling. Because when I ask what, you, what is your feeling, people often say, well, I feel tired or I feel hungry or I feel sick. 
and, and we do feel that physically or physiologically, but when I'm asking the question, what do you feel, I'm typically asking for your emotion. And the way I teach this, and different people have different models, but I teach that there's six basic emotions. Anger, sadness, fear, joy, shame, and guilt. And how I like to define emotions is that they are signals. Our emotions are signals that alert us to the fact that something in our environment needs uh, some attention so that we can return to a place of harmony. And, and I guess just to clarify, I would say that more than not, all of the emotions would be exception of happiness. Because when we're in that space of happiness, then things are pretty harmonious and beautiful in but with the other five emotions, though, there's usually an indication that something in our environment needs some attention. So, so essentially our emotions are energy that comes up in response to situations and circumstances that alert us to some action that needs to be taken to restore us to a place of harmony. Mm, great definition. Judge, how would, how would you define feelings slash emotions? <laughs> I think Russell uh, covered uh, most of it uh, as well as I could. Uh, I think it's, it's important in, that in our language uh, that when we are asking the question or when we are making statements of I feel that I should be clear whether that, that feeling is a physical feeling, whether that feeling um, <clears throat> is an emotional feeling. Or I think where we we fall short in our communication is that we use the word feeling synonymously with our judgments and thoughts. And so if a person is saying, you know, this is how I feel, uh, I would like for them to also be clear whether they're talking about their emotions, whether they're talking about their, their physical uh, body sensations, or whether they're talking about their judgments and, 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 <clears throat> and thoughts. Um, and uh, Russell uh, laid it out pretty good uh, in, in, in the, the basic emotions. Uh, we, we differ a little bit in, 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 the, in the fact that uh, he holds uh, shame and, and guilt as, as primary emotions, and I hold shame and guilt as uh, judgments based in fear. Um, and those points are not are not arguable with me and, and him. I think it's just an understanding that I have, an understanding that he has. I don't think we, we disagree with how they impact us. Um, but that's my my take on what the the emotional literacy is about: is learning when we are talking about our emotions, whether we're talking about our physicality or whether we're talking about our thoughts and judgments. Thank you. Ernest, would you like to interject your definition or add anything to that dialogue? Yeah, just briefly, Michael. I, I think Russell and Judge did a masterful job in, in just really explaining uh, you know, emotions and feelings. But one thing for me, and, and Russell kind of alluded to it also, is that emotions is, to me, is just energy and motion. That is the energy in my body that that I can feel that energy. Now, my personal belief is that my body knows what I'm feeling before my mind does. If I pay attention to what's going on in my body, that will lead me to a place if I if I trust it and I believe in it and what's really going on inside of me. And, and I just think that to be able to create some language for that, I, I don't believe they're good and bad, it's just they're, they're emotions. And just to be aware and conscious of, of really what's going on inside of me. Now, Neil Donald Walsh said something that I really loved when he, when he started talking about emotions. He said that emotions are the language of the soul. And there are internal guidance system for navigating through life, and I, I really like that definition, and it really is in alignment with what Russell was saying. And so now that we have a an understanding of emotions, the, the next question that comes up is that 
the title of this topic is Men's Emotional Healing. So what I'd like to ask is, in your opinion, what is it that causes a man to begin disconnecting from his emotions in the first place? And let's start with you, Ernest. What are your thoughts around that? Thank you, Michael. Um, my, my thought around that, Michael, is that when a, when a little boy, when a child is born into this world, you, you take a little boy maybe around the age of four or five, and that little boy falls down and scrapes his knee. And that little boy begins to cry. And some of the elders that's around that little boy or some of the older siblings or or even young men in their lives, and, and perhaps even the mom, and that little boy falls and begins to cry. And all of a sudden, he begins to hear the message that boys don't cry, men don't cry. And, and for a little boy to hear that, that, that boys don't cry or men don't cry, a five-year-old is not a man. And so it's already confusing when that little boy hear that. And, and there's a plethora of different things that's said when that little boy falls down. And, and all of a sudden, that little boy begins to connect from the, their true essence of, of who they are to experience those emotions. And all of a sudden, it's not safe for them because what's been told is that if I get vulnerable, and really express my emotions of sadness and, 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 and fear that for whatever reason that constitutes that I'm, 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 I'm not a man or I'm not a boy. And so I believe during that process young boys began to grow up feeling unsafe to really express their emotions and feelings. Mm -hmm. Judge, what's your thoughts on that? I agree 100% uh, with what Ernest just said, and to take that a, a step further, the whole society that we live in, the atmosphere, the television, the newspapers, all of the media is constantly telling young boys how to act, and those messages are, have very little to do with expressing themselves from an authentic emotional place. Those messages are telling them to man up. Those messages are telling them to be be strong. Those messages are telling them not to cry. Those messages are telling them don't let people see you sweat. And and every one of those messages are telling them not to be authentic. And when we are teaching our young men and women, when we're teaching our, our younger generations not to be authentic, we're also teaching them not to honor what, what Ernest was talking about, that message that's coming through our body, that message that you were talking about, the messages from the soul. Don't pay attention to those. Don't let people see you in that because if they do, you will be weak. You will be labeled. You will be ostracized. You won't be one of us. And so we learn to, to not express ourselves. We learn to, to ignore or pretend not to have feelings. Hmm. Russell? Yeah, I would agree with what every, everything that's been said so far. I would also add another element to that. And, and again, it goes back into this whole socialization piece. Because essentially that's what Judge and Ernest are talking about. It's how little boys are socialized. At the same token, you have to take a look at what has been men's role in society. And men have been the more task oriented gender, so to speak. It's up to men to go out and kill the buffalo and bring it back to the tribe. It's up to men to go out and fight the wars. You know, it's up for men to uh, up to men to do, 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 and do. And you have your task oriented uh, styles of functioning in life and you have your relational oriented styles of functioning in life. And so historically, and I would also say stereotypically, uh, men have been more in the task-oriented arena. And so when you're going out on the hunt, or when you're going out fighting the war, 
or were you going out to make a living and to provide and do all the things that have been designated for men to do, emotions don't factor or have not factored very heavily into them. So I would say that's also another piece of that bigger picture of what causes men to be disconnected from their uh, emotional experience. Now, I would like to say that because society has evolved into what it has evolved into, we are seeing a lot of shifting in terms of not only just men's roles, but the ability of men to be more balanced in terms of attending to tasks as well as attending to the more relational side of our living. Yeah, and that leads me into the next segment here is because there's a lot of emphasis now put on emotional intelligence. And from a male perspective, I think it's something that's definitely needed. And it's the reason why we're on this call right now is because we're promoting this idea that it's okay for men to be in touch with their emotions. It, it's, it's, it's actually paramount to their success, their happiness in life, to be connected to their inner world. And so I'm curious to know, so I want you, you guys to share actually with the viewing audience. We're talking about emotions, and each of you have, have talked about your expert, areas of expertise, but I'm sure there was a time in your life when maybe you weren't connected. I know from my own experience, I was completely disconnected, which I will go into later. But I wonder if you can explain or share how did you get involved in dealing with your emotional life? And I'll start with you, Judge. Um, wow, Micah, that, that's a very, uh, very good question. Um, I got involved uh, after after being a, a member of a a twelve step group that I uh, became affiliated with. Uh, before coming to this twelve step group, I had no real uh, awareness that uh, I had a an emotional. Um, <clears throat> uh, actually, I, I had a a commotional commitment not to feel that I was even hiding from myself. Uh, and what I mean by that was I had an emotional commitment not to express my sadness, not to uh, allow myself to be angry, uh, and you know to always seek nothing but the euphoric uh, that that the euphoria that came you know with using drugs in an attempt to be happy. Uh, and you know because I was this big, strong, athletic guy who played football, I never ever wanted you to, you know, have the uh, uh, idea that I was afraid of anything. Um, so, so when I got to, to, to doing the 12-step work, I started to realize that there were a lot of things on an emotional scale that I was afraid to, to touch, to even to get close to. Um, one of the things that I, that I was uh, running from was the the sadness and the grief of my brother's death, uh, and in that I was also running from the sadness and grief of losing uh, or being separated, you know, from my first child and my first divorce and my second divorce, and all of those 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 emotional impactful things that were happening to me. I wasn't giving myself permission to explore those, and what that caused in me was this, you know, almost suicidal uh, 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 phase of my life. And uh, as I came closer to wanting to end my life, you know, I, uh, something clicked, you know, something said, you know, wait a minute, what's really going on? And I started looking for some help. And the help that I got was start taking a look at the real emotional parts of myself. Uh, and it took years. It took years for me to I uh, began to trust. It took years for me to begin to explore and to really uh, see myself as an emotional being and, and not just this, this plastic man. Thank you for sharing that. Russell, would you share with us your experience? Yeah, for me, 
<clears throat> excuse me, for me, that's an ever-evolving process, is what comes to me in this moment. Uh, obviously, in the, the field and profession that I'm in, uh, the exposure to emotions and feelings uh, came with, with studying to become a, become a therapist. Um, it, it's, it's a very kind of paradoxical experience I have because on the one hand, I have always been very in touch with my emotions and my feelings, particularly sadness and grief. And on the other hand, I can be very disconnected from those things at the same time. So it, it's, it's been an ever-evolving process through first just studying um, uh, to do the work that I do and then doing my own personal work on myself. Um, <clears throat> it, 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 it's all opened me up to what's going on internally. Uh, because I think that to be effective in this work that I do, that it requires me being connected to what's going on with my inner self as well. So it, it's it's a constant place of reflecting. It's a constant place of exploring, um, constantly asking myself the question, okay, what energy is, happen is inside of me right now? What am I really feeling right now? Um, and, and getting clear on that. So it's an ongoing process. Ernest, reflections? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Michael. Um, I, I guess what really comes up for me um, that I'm really clear about is pain is an incredible motivator. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I got to a point in my life where, you know, this kind of cliche is, but I got, you know, sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I know neither what I was really connected to was my my anger. Uh, you know, I, I remember growing up as a child that that's the one thing, that's the emotion that really wasn't allowed in my home. And, and so I suppressed it. But as I got older, it came out sideways. You know, I, I remember I have a brother that's two years older than I am, and, and I would hang out with him, and he really didn't like to hang out with him because I would fight all his friends. And, but I really wasn't angry at them. I was angry at, at home, and, and, and I just didn't have any outlets. And I played sports, but I didn't shut it off even after the sports. And, and, and that went into drug use, and, and 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 so I was really disconnected to my sadness and grief. And it wasn't until, you know, I got into recovery, and even in recovery, I was still disconnected. And I would really say that once I joined uh, the Mankind Project, sitting in circles with men, and eventually I sat in circles with women also. That it was okay, that it was safe for me to, to to express sadness. It was okay for me to express hurt because the only thing again that I was really connected to was my anger. So I used anger for every emotion, and and I had to grow. And, and like Russell say, it is an ongoing process uh, because I know how they can get the emotions can get confused, and and for me to have some clarity about. You know where I'm at. What's going on with me in the present moment? That's an ongoing process for me. Uh, but it was, <laughs> I wasn't willing to do the work until I was in enough pain. And and I guess for me, uh, my my what I like to call growing edge is to get to a place where I don't have to be in so much pain to want to do the work. Yeah. Yeah. Interestingly enough, for me. Um, after my divorce, what I noticed is I had a difficult time creating relationships, connection. And there was this recurring theme with the women that I was involved with, which was, you're not emotionally available. And I remember trying to figure that out in my head, you know, what the heck does that mean? <laughs> You know what? 
I'm not emotionally available. I'm a nice guy. You know, I thought, you know, I was a good guy and loyal and, and all of those things, fun to be with, but not, not emotionally available? Well, I can see now in retrospect the reason they were saying that was true. I was completely disconnected from my inner self, my inner world. I did not know how to speak from my heart, to open my heart, to trust in relationship. And that's how I, I began my journey because I got, like you, Ernest, I got sick and tired of being sick and tired of relationships not working out. And so it was really important for me, I made a commitment that if I didn't do anything else in my life, I was going to figure out how to create a relationship that worked. <laughs> and it took a lot of work. I mean, it took a lot of work. But ultimately, I did my emotional healing work, and I have now created a 12-year a, a marriage that's just wonderful. Uh, it, it, it works for me on all levels. And I couldn't have been able to say this some 15, 20 years ago when I started this process because I was completely disconnected from my emotions. So for those who are viewing this, my invitation is for you to stop for a moment and just sort of take a look at your life and ask yourself, how are your relationships right now? Are they loving and connected and, and, and fulfilling? Or are they filled with drama and anger, frustration and fighting? Because they all have at their root cause, if they're, if they're negative, emotional. There's, there's something emotional going on that we have to be willing to look at if we want to create great relationships. And so I know that as men, we struggle with relationships primarily because we're disconnected from our emotions. And it's important that we have this conversation and begin sharing with each other the, the that we've learned that have supported us so that you, the viewer, possibly can take action if you choose so that you can do your own emotional healing work. So with that said, I wanted to, we talk about emotional intelligence, and I'm wondering now if you can stop and think back that as you started doing this work, and I wonder if you can share a story maybe of how not being connected to your emotions affected your professional life. And I'll actually, I'll actually begin uh, with this conversation because this is, this is, for me, what I found most of my life at an early age, I was very, very successful. And people would see Michael Taylor and they would say, man, that guy's got it all together. But the fact was, I was in so much pain that success was like a drug for me. It allowed me to feel good about myself because when people would see all these things I accomplished, and they would congratulate me and acknowledge me and say, man, you're such a good guy. But the truth was, I was actually driven by the feeling of shame. I had this deep sense of something's wrong with me. So by being successful, I tried to negate that feeling. And it wasn't until I started doing my work, my inner emotional work, that I realized and recognized that first and foremost, I don't have to accomplish anything to be loved. I can just be me. And trust me, that was a huge burden off of my back when I started doing this work to come to that realization to do anything. I just have to learn how to love and accept myself. But in my work context, most of my success was driven by emotion. And when I say negative, I'm not saying bad. So as you're watching this, we must understand that emotions are neither good nor bad. They are what I'll call positive or negative. And so for me, that negative experience, that negative feeling of shame drove me to continue to bring more negative experiences into my life because it was an experience. It was a negative. By resolving and healing that negative experience, 
I moved to more positive experiences in my work life. Hopefully that clicked. So I wanted to know, um, Russell, let's start with you. Can you think of a time in your work life where maybe it was a, your, life, your work life was affected by your inability to express your emotions? Well, I, I think I would answer that question in the reverse, that okay. how my work life is enhanced, but the more work I've done to become emotionally intelligent, and to become emotionally aware, because I think that's the first step to emotional intelligence, is the awareness and being able to put a label on this energy that's going on inside of me. And then also, with through the work that I've done, kind of understanding what some of the roots of that is. Because in any, all of our emotions are, are triggered by a particular event or circumstance. And oftentimes, the emotion that's triggered by that event or circumstance goes back a lot further than just what's going on right now. And so, in, 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 in being able to utilize that as information, if you will, to give me insight into some things that need to be resolved within myself, and, and actually doing that work it frees me up and it, it opens me up to greater clarity to be in presence with people that I'm working with. So the doing the work that I've done to become more emotionally intelligent has enhanced my work uh, over the years. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, so what are your thoughts on that in terms of work and how your work has your doing your inner work has helped your work or some experiences where it affected your work negatively. Is that me, Michael? Or? Yes, for you, Ernest. Right. Okay, good. Um, well, I was just I was thinking about a, the last job I had at another facility, and you know, and I would get these awards as uh, you know the the, the nice guy, and so I would kind of post them on my wall, and 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 what I recognized about myself, and I was talking to a guy one day, and and he, and he shared with me, "What's that about?" And you know, me having that, I like to call it this pseudo persona. That, that I'm the nice guy all the time. And and so that's kind of that mask that I wore and so I wanted people to like me and and so I would not speak my truth. And even though underneath that there was some frustration and anger, you know, I didn't trust that. And and so I would just say I'm fine, I'm okay and I'm the nice guy. And and that really hurt me. And because I really wasn't being authentic, and so as I continued to grow and you know with my emotional intelligence, you know, it gave me the confidence to be able to say you know this is not right, to to really kind of set a boundary. And when I was triggered, because what I know is that any event that happens in my life doesn't have any meaning to it until I give it a meaning. And, and so, you know, from that place, I could speak to it. I mean, I've grown to a place in my life now that I can sit with someone. If something's not right, I don't think it's right that I can share it and not come from a place of fear that, well, they're not going to like me anymore. And the risk is they might not. But I'm willing to step into that today as opposed to in the past. Thank you. Judge, any thoughts? Um, well, Michael, I, I I have lots of thoughts. I, I when I think about, I, I don't know if, if it's so much my professional life as uh, in growing up, um, you know, for a child to to be angry or show anger. Uh, and, my, and where I grew up was just not something that was going to be accepted at all. Uh, of course, until I found sports. 
And after I found sports uh, and football and basketball especially, I could channel that energy of that anger into my play. And I, 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 I think about that as I watch these uh, professional athletes and pro athletes and college athletes today uh, as to how many of them are taking you know the energy that they get from an emotion like anger and and channel that into being uh, the the aggressive the, the 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 spot on the ball the 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 the, the person uh, who is always you know focused on on the task at hand uh, and I believe that that once I stop playing sports uh, that anger that I that I could channel so easily in sports had nowhere to go and you know it when I didn't have anywhere to go it affected how I showed up in in the workplaces because when I got angry in the workplaces you know uh, after especially if I had been holding it in for, for some time, it was going to come out sideways and I was going to say something or do something that was going to either get me fired or, you know, get me put on, you know, the list of people to, to pay attention to, to look out for, because that kind of person would hurt you. I was the kind of person that would hurt you when I stopped playing sports because I had nowhere for that anger to go. Mm. Wow. And so... The reason that I brought up how our lack of emotional intelligence affects our relationships and our think from a male perspective, when you have not done this work, it can be a little confusing. I know that when I first started, I, I, I felt so disconnected when I'd listen to people talk about their emotions because I was so disconnected. <laughs> so thank you, thank, thank you, men, for sharing you know those stories because I think it will help men kind of grasp where we're coming from when we start talking about emotions. And so with that said, I want to talk about I think is extremely important. It's been said that all addictive behaviors have at their core an unresolved emotional conflict. And so we have a lot of men out there who are dealing with addictions, and, and obviously there's lots of different types of addictions out there, but until we can challenge men to deal with their emotions, it's difficult, if not impossible, for them to do those addictions. So, Ernest, I'm wondering if you can, if you can briefly speak to how that unresolved emotional conflict can drive those addictive behaviors. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Michael. You know, just my experience, uh, even today working with uh, young males and you know, young girls with uh, issues with chemical dependency and substance abuse, is that a couple of things happen. Either, you know, they have this uh, kind of inflated emotions where they just come gushing out or they have kind of deflated where they have a difficult time emotional to, emoting all together. And what I've noticed is that they don't have a real clear indication of what they're experiencing on the inside. I mean, it's really confusing uh, for them. And a lot of times they just don't want to feel at all. I mean, and come from a family dynamic where there's a lot of trauma, physical, sexual abuse, and 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 they don't know how to deal with that. They don't know how what they should, you know, even give it a name what they're feeling. And and so what they do to really deal with that is to abuse drugs. And, and they will continue that cycle because what it does, it gives them some temporary relief. And, and after it gives them that temporary relief, you know, they'll continue to do it over and over because they have experienced some relief from the pain or the frustration that they just want to numb out. 
And that's really how the addiction sets in because once they continue to do that for relief, I like to say that, you know, all of them say, well, I'll never cross that line. Well, what happens is that the line crosses them before they even know it. Uh-huh. Russell, give us some insights in terms of addictive behaviors and not being able or connected to your emotions. I, I think Ernest touched on it very, very well. You know, what I've seen with... Uh, clients, people who struggle with addiction, is that the emotions are overwhelming and they're looking for relief, you know, they're, you know in, in the drugs or whatever the mechanism of addiction is, is a way to get some sort of relief. And the emotions become uncomfortable, so while the drug or the work or the exercise or whatever provides some sort of relief, the root of the problem is never dealt with. And I, I often like to think of recovery in terms of you, you, you learn how to stop using the drug or the substance or whatever it is. And then there's the deeper work, which is what is the unresolved issue that I haven't been able to get to. You know? And so, again, as I said earlier, our emotions are a signal. And if we can stay with that signal long enough and ask the right question, okay, I'm feeling this, it's overwhelming me, it's causing me a lot of pain, you know, what, what is this trying to tell me? You know, what, what is this pointing me towards that new feeling? But a lot of times when we have so many traumatic issues or painful things that's happened in our lives that have gone unresolved, whenever, whenever, whenever anything triggers an emotion, we start to feel the, 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 the whole range of all of that, and at that point, we're just looking for relief. And, and so that's where addictive behavior uh, comes in. Okay. Judge, any thoughts on addictive behaviors and the emotional conflict that's driving them? Hmm. Well, you know, <clears throat> one of the things I've been learning and is, is the concept that most addictive behaviors... Uh, grow out of a message that I carry or that I carried uh, which says that I don't love right. And so if I have the belief that internalized message of not loving right, uh, then you know how am I ever going to be in any kind of relationship? Whether I'm not just talking about romantic relationships, but I'm talking about relationship with family, relationship with friends, relationship with coworkers, relationship uh, with with the stranger that I meet on the bus. If there's something inside of me that is that I have eternalized, some message that I've taken on that says I don't love right, then what happens to me? is then, you know, I, I, I want to become invisible. I want to become, uh, 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 um, as I think Russell said it, I want to get numb and, and, and have no emotional connection at all. I, I don't want to, I don't want to be angry. I don't want to be sad. I don't want to be afraid. You know, <clears throat> I don't even want to feel, you know. I, what, what, and what, and that's really what happens when I start, you know, using these chemical, uh, uh, what I want to call substitutions for emotions. When I start taking the chemical in order to to amp up my feeling, amp up my my feeling about myself, my belief about myself, then I now I'm okay, and I'm okay because nothing can hurt me. I'm okay because I don't care about anybody else. I'm okay. I'm okay, and I'm really not. And that's what I don't want to be able to to hear anymore. I don't want to hear that message that says I don't love right. Because if I hear that, if I tell myself that one more time, then I don't want to exist. And that's really what addictions are really all about. It is that part of me that no longer wants to be. That part of me that no longer wants to be human. To have the human experience of emotion. Because that is the human experience. That is my soul, as you said, Michael, speaking out to me. 
when my emotions of sadness, my emotions of anger, my emotions of joy, my fear, you know, my guilt and my shame, when I take that away, then I'm not wanting to be human anymore. You know, I don't even want to exist, and I'm afraid to even admit that. And the drugs keep me from doing that. The drugs keep me from having that awareness. You know, the addiction keeps me from doing that. And I'm saying the drug, because the drug doesn't have to be a chemical. It could be shopping. It could be gambling. It could be, you you name a hundred thousand things that we do that are obsessive to keep the emotions at bay. Right. Right. So now we've talked a little bit about emotions and hopefully as you're watching this you this of possibly needing or wanting to address your emotional challenges that you may have so I'd like to now move into so what can we do to help us heal that emotional conflict that may be going on inside of us so I'd like to give each of you an opportunity to share what are some things that a person can do that supports them in moving through the emotional conflict. So Russell, I'll begin with you. Um, well, I, I think even before action starts, the one thing to, to be mindful of is that dealing with emotions won't kill you. Uh, I think that people often have this idea that if I go here, uh, that the world's going to stop spinning, we're all going to go flying off into space or something. So the first thing is to realize that embracing this part of our humanity is not going to hurt us. It might be uncomfortable, uh, but the question to ask then is, am I not uncomfortable anyway? So, uh, so that's the first thing, is realizing that if I begin to open myself up to being more connected to this experience of mine, whatever that is, um, it may be uncomfortable, but there's benefit in doing so. Um, in terms of you know action steps to take, obviously um, doing what I do for a living, uh, you know, naturally I would say there are many different professionals that can help people begin to have that conversation explore their emotions, uh, and come to a better understanding of what they are. Um, you know, as I said in the beginning, that's part of one of the core elements of my, my work is helping people to identify what those feelings are, put a label on them, and the, the beauty of or what I think emotional intelligence is all about is how do you harness that energy and be able to channel it in a way that's going to be effective for you. And that, that's really what it's all about. Because these energies that come up in us are there for a reason. And they can harm us or hurt us. We have control over how we can use these energies. And I can guarantee you, these energies can be channeled for your success in your life. Um, so naturally, psychotherapy is, 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 is certainly something someone could do. I know all of us have attended many different workshops and seminars, retreats. Um, there are a variety of mechanisms out there um, to be of assistance. Uh, there's no shortage of books on the subject. Uh, I know, Michael, you're an avid reader. Um, so those are just some, some starting points. Yeah, and, and that will open up an entire world. I you know in, in beginning the work that I did, uh, in particular with the Mankind Project, I'm amazed at all of the resources that are in my life now that came as a result of taking that one tiny step. Yeah. And, and I, I have to reiterate the importance of, um, especially as men, the willingness to simply seek support. We have such a negative stigma in our society about men asking for help that, I mean, men are literally dying because they're afraid to simply say, I need help. 
and we have to change that conversation. We, we, we must make it okay for men to recognize that it is absolutely okay to say, I need help. And so, Russell, you, you, you hit the nail on the head. It may begin with simply making a commitment to just going to therapy and just talking to someone about it. It may not be therapy. It may be um, someone in your church. But just being knowledge that there's something going on that you can't handle at this moment, it's important that men know that there are resources available. And that's, that's why I'm doing this program. I want men to know that there are resources available. That's why we're having this conversation. Russ, um, I'm sorry, Judge, what are your any thoughts, any ideas of where, how does a person start this healing process? Uh, Michael, you know, the, the very first step of, of every 12-step program I've ever um, been a part of starts with the acceptance. The, the acceptance of the fact that, um, you know, there is something really wrong with me and you know that my life right now is not going you know the way it, it could in its in its in its most glorious form uh, so something is wrong and, and and my life is not working but once I once I I admit to that then I'm open to everything that Russell was talking about but I have to start with with recognizing that something is wrong. I have to start with rec recognizing that it's not working. I have to start with recognizing, uh, as you said, I need help. All right. And 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 once once we can do that and and and, and begin to remove those those what I would call debilitating uh, patterns of behavior, you know. Uh, Russell said it again. Then that's when the flood of emotions are going to come, and when the flood of emotions is going to come, I need to to be ready to accept the help of others. You know, um, so you know that's I, I think that's the most important thing is to recognize that my life is not working, recognize I need help, and then you know stop doing all of the things you know that get me to that place of being you know emotionalist or 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 in that place of not owning what my emotional state is because once i start owning what my emotional state is i can start looking at the impact of 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 holding on to that emotional state you know it was once said to me that every emotional experience that i have every emotional you know flow that I have, it's all cyclical. It's going to start and it's going to end. And usually from the beginning of, of, of the pattern to the end of the pattern, it is about six seconds unless I decide to hold on to it, unless I cling to that emotion. If I cling to it, then it really begins to debilitate to me. So the thing I would want people to know is that, you know, emotions are going to come, they're going to go, and I get to choose whether to hold on to them or not. And I only learned that by working with others. I only learned that by asking for help. I only learned that when I was willing to take the steps to allow other people to show me what they knew, things that I didn't know. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Ernest, your thoughts on where or what a person can do to begin that emotional healing process? Yeah, that's it's just a lot of really incredible things have been said already and you know I don't, I don't want to just kind of echo the same things but I, I do want to say that um, I think it was you Michael that talked about how the emotions is, is really just a guidance system to, to, to see whether we're on the right path or not and I think for me it's I can only see so far. Uh, in front of me, I can, you know, my peripheral, I can see okay, but I can only see so far. And I need other people in my life uh, to see my blind spots. 
And once I can get feedback from other people to give it a voice, whatever is going on with me, to give it a voice, it, it seems to take the power away from it. And what I know today is that, you know, whatever I'm going through, even if I'm in a lot of pain, that it's not going to kill me. Well, at one time, I thought I was probably going to die. And once I realize it's not going to kill me, that's how I grow. That's how it helps me, me grow because the next time, because there will be a next time, when I go through that experience, I can reflect back on how I got through it the last time and say, well, that didn't really kill me the last time, and I'm sure I can get beyond that also. So it's personal experience being able to go through it. Also, you talked about you know workshops and churches and you know and and and, and also you know joining different organizations uh, because this this is ongoing. Uh, it's not something that you do one time or that I do one time and and that's it. It's it's, it's continuous and being committed to it. Because if I'm not committed to it, uh, you know, it, it's difficult for me uh, to continue growing. And lastly, I want to say this, because I truly believe that there is a spiritual solution to, to all problems. And being able to kind of reconnect with that divinity or that the, the essence of who I am, the core of who I am, I, I think that that will help me to grow and get me back in touch with my true essence. And to me, that true essence is love. And and if I'm able to connect with something greater than me or name, no name, or, or some type of belief system uh, that can help guide me, it can re reconnect me to my, my divinity. Well said. Well said. So, emotional healing is is a complex topic. Um, I wanted to use this opportunity to have some men share uh, their experiences. So, that as you're watching this, hopefully, uh, there was something that was said that will trigger you to look within and ask yourself some questions about whether or not there's some emotional healing that needs to pl take place within you. Uh, this, as mentioned, is an ongoing conversation when we start talking about healing. But it all begins with the first step. It all begins with your willingness to say, I need help. And once you do that, then I know that um, you'll be guided along the path that will, will take you where wherever you need to go. And so Black Man Rock is a resource that's designed to provide you with some insights and information to live extraordinary lives. And this conversation, I hope, will be an important one that you will really pay attention to. Um, because these men and myself, we've, we've been doing this work for a pretty long time. And again, the insights that we're sharing is primarily based on our own personal experience. We're not claiming to be experts or to have all the answers. But what we do have is experience and a commitment to empowering you to live an extraordinary life. So with that said, I want to thank you gentlemen for participating in this uh, conversation, this roundtable about men's emotional healing. And I want to give each of you an opportunity right now as we close to share a little inspiration, if you will to the man or woman who's watching this video and, and, and maybe thinking, you know, there's something to that, you know, and, and so whatever is on your spirit to share, I just want to give you an opportunity to close with, the, you know, some words of wisdom. So I'll start with you, Judge. Thank you, Michael. Um, so if you're out there watching, um, what I'd like for you to, to take with you is that, uh, that <clears throat> that greater essence that I am that Ernest talked about that that thing that he called love uh, is inside of you and that it is 
a guiding light for you to follow. Uh, so my hope for you is that you're ready. My hope for you is that you want to be the best you that you can be. My hope for you is that you want healing for yourself and the world. And if you start with the emotional healing of yourself, uh, then the world can can only be a better place. Thank you, Josh. Ernest. Mm. Yes, Michael, um, and thank you, Judge. Uh, I, I guess what I want to leave the audience with is, for me, the, one of the truest forms of humility is for me to know that I don't know. And, and if I be in that place of knowing that I that I don't know I'm in a place of learning and I can be taught and lastly is that this work that that we do is what I've realized that nothing on the outside is going to sustain me sustain my joy, sustain my happiness. It's nothing on the outside that's going to sustain that because it's fleeting. It's not going to last long. It, sometimes it perishes even with the use of it. And it's from the inside that if I'm able to connect with my joy, my happiness and peace, if I'm able to, 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 to really grow from the inside, regardless of what happened on the outside, I'll have a reasonable amount of joy and peace in my life. Thank you, Ernest. Russell. Okay. Um, I guess I'm, I'm thinking about something that I said several years ago as it relates to our emotions. And I may not do that justice, but it's the idea that this whole experience that we are in is an experience of love. It's all about love. And so if I'm angry, then the love that this experience, that, that this experience has for me is somehow blocked. Um, if I'm sad, then I've somehow lost that love. And if I'm in a place of fear, then I somehow fear that the love I have will be lost, and I, I may not get it back. And if I'm in a place of shame or guilt, then there's something I've done, or there's something about me that causes me to be unlovable. And so all of our emotions are guiding posts back to love. Because if we can understand that this whole experience is about love, and that I am love, and that you are love, and that we were all created out of love, all of our emotions are there to help direct us back to that love and that experience that we're all here to partake in and enjoy. And one, one final note that I often tell people is that this life is far too complex, it's far too big, and it's far too greater than we are as individual beings to do alone. So rely on your support. And if you don't have support, find support. It's out there, I can assure you. You men are a testament to that in my life. And because things will come that cause us to get angry and sad and scared and hurt. And we have to have safe places and safe people to go to to deal with that. Because it's too much for any one person to bear alone. Yeah, and I would I would just close by actually I want to close by simply saying if you're watching this, no matter what the circumstances are, you are not alone. There are people out there that will support you. There are people out there who will give a helping hand. You know, it's been said that no man is an island. So we're not separated. We're all connected. Do is we want to stay connected. We want to become aware of our connectedness. And that is the intention of Black Men Rock. 
is to be a resource that supports and inspires you to live an extraordinary life. But you've got to be willing to connect. You've got to be willing to take the steps necessary so that your life becomes the life that I know you're capable of. So with that said, I just want to thank my panelists for joining me in this important topic. Know that one hour just isn't long enough to go deep, deeply enough, but I think it provided the audience with some insights that can support them in living an extraordinary life. So let me just say thank you. I honor each of you men for participating. And this has been another episode of the Black Men Rock Roundtable Discussion. I'm your host, Coach Michael Taylor, and we'll see you next episode. Take care. Mm -hmm.